Amazon today is the most valuable company in the world. And when we look at tech companies, the fan companies of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, these are some of the most valuable and defensible companies in their respective industries. Yet when we look at the video games industry, we don't see the same level of long-term defensibility that we see in those industries. So the topic of our discussion today is as follows. One, what are the current defensibility strategies of game companies today? Two, how defensible are gaming companies? Three, how can game companies build greater long-term defensibility? Four, how should management teams be thinking about building greater defensibility into their companies? And five, which game company, in your opinion, has that greatest defensibility in the market today? Uh, who will be around 100 years from today? And with us today to speak about all of these issues and more, and, and by the way, guys, I was just, as I was reviewing the notes before the call, I have to say I'm, you know, I'm very honored that the three of you guys are coming to speak with me today. I, I think your backgrounds are so impressive, but first we've got Lloyd Melnick, GM of Chumba Casino at VGW. Second, Christian Segerstrahl, CEO of Super Evil Megacorp, and Mark Sotosanti, SVP at my favorite games company, Riot Games. So just given how impressive your backgrounds are, I thought you could also just tell us a little bit more about kind of where you work and some of the impressive history that you guys have. Maybe starting with you, Lloyd. Uh, and it's actually, I'm really honored to be with the other guys. So my history is not as impressive, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, a little bit of background is, and especially why it may be relevant to this topic. So I've been in the video game and gaming industry since 1993. So we've been chasing this defensibility holy grail since then. So for you know, 25 years, I've been thinking about it. And to be you know, perfectly blunt, no one's figured it out yet. But I uh, you know, love talking about it. So as I said, I've been in the industry for 25 years. Started a, uh, actually, I started a company. I was a small video game um, developer, publisher. Uh, into casual and then social gaming it was acquired by Playdom. Uh, at the time, Playdom was one of the three big social game companies with Christians, uh, Playfish, and Zynga. Um, you know, a few months after that, we were acquired by Disney, where I was running the uh, all the international distribution over a digital. Um, fast forward a couple of years, moved into social casino with a company called Spooky Cool Labs that was then acquired by Zynga. Uh, it was senior director over a social casino there moved from Zynga to run social gaming for the Stars Group. So if you're familiar with Poker Stars, which is the largest real money poker site, they went into social, was there for four years, kind of launched that, uh, moved it into profitability, thank God. Uh, but then, uh, as you said, I've been at VGW for the last year running their social casino product called Chumba Casino, also on the board of directors of Merca, uh, which is one another uh, top 10 social gaming company. So, you know, Long story short, it's been around a long time and I've seen a lot both uh, pretty and ugly in the game industry, but also I've kind of seen what's worked and what hasn't. So, yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's great to be in this group. I think the second that you believe that you're particularly impressive, I think is the, the day when your career is going to take a downturn in this industry. The thing I really appreciate and admire and love about this industry is how it changes all the time. And while all the experience and background and the things that you've done maybe taught you some things, there's also so many new things happening all the time from, you know, from everywhere. So it's always, it's a pleasure to be part of conversations like this, which are really all about where the industry is moving. Uh, I've been a game entrepreneur. In fact, this July will mark my 20th year of building computer games companies. So I was a co-founder of what today I suppose is Glue Mobile. My company was called Microspace. We merged with a company called Sorrent in the US. Uh, we both hated each other's names. So we renamed the thing Glue Mobile and then went public in 2007, making the very first generation of mobile games. So with a dream of bringing kind of Nintendo Game Boy style play to mobile. Um, going public was no fun at the time. I didn't understand it. I'm a product, I love product. I love making great product and game distribution for mobile back then was kind of poor and was very focused on brand over experience and taught me a lot about industry dynamics in general, but I left after a quarter of, you know, being a, being a, a public company in order to found a company called Playfish, which was that, for us, it was a dream of what if the Nintendo Wii had a love child world with Facebook? Like, how could you create that sense of playing together, that sort of everybody, you know, in a sort of bright, happy environment, having fun together, but instead of being in the, in the living room, you know, being online. I did that for about, well, two years, 23 months from founding it to ultimately becoming part of EA um, in 2009. 
and stayed at EA for a couple of years. I was an executive vice president of digital, helping out figure out how to help build the foundations for EA to be a much more DC driven, much more engagement driven, live ops driven company um, than, than it was certainly back then shipping product. Tried to play full-time investor for a little bit, invested in companies like Supercell, um, some others, and but got very bored attempting to be an investor and actually did invest in Super Evil Mega Corp early on uh, and uh, ultimately jumped on full-time and took on the chief exec job a couple of years back. Great. Mark? Uh, yeah, hi. I'm honored to be here with you all. You've all started game companies, um, which is a dream of mine to do someday. But, um, but yeah, I've been at Riot since 2012 when I was hired to run monetization for League of Legends. Uh, and then over time, my role expanded to include other teams such as analytics and research, uh, investments and acquisitions and uh, strategic finance and forecasting. So uh, prior to Riot, my background was in traditional e-commerce and running a hedge fund uh, for a few years. So while I was an active gamer when I started at Riot, I did not have any prior industry experience. All right, great. So maybe we could just jump right into the first topic is really around defensibility strategies of game companies today. And I thought there was actually a really great post by the venture capital firm NFX that talked about the categorization of defensibilities along four different areas. One is economies of scale. Second is brand. Third is something they call embedding. And fourth is network effects. And I think by embedding, they mean if your solution is part of someone else's solution, sort of like having Facebook, uh, Facebook connect within games or things like that. So in terms of like the broad categorization, I'm wondering, do you guys feel that this is a good way of thinking about defensibilities kind of at the higher level, or are we missing any kind of categories that you think are important? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, if I can go first, the framework makes a lot of sense to me. I, I agree that all four of those can and do provide meaningful defensibility for, for the FANG companies and others. It was interesting to me that they exclude culture and talent, which you know, could be because they don't think those types of advantages are sustainable over time or they just don't think it rises to that level of impact. I do think culture and talent can provide a sustained competitive advantage, like it did for companies like Pixar that allowed them to take on you know, Disney animation and, and win over and over. But culture and talent advantages will always be at risk as people come and go. So I, I agree with their conclusion and with uh, you know, the view that game companies haven't been able to create the same level of defensibility as, as Fang has. Right, and along that line, in terms of culture and talent, maybe we could even broaden that to be more like organizational defensibility. And Christian, I know you invested in Supercell, and they're kind of famous for their kind of decentralized approach or the organizational structure. Do you, would you consider that a defensibility or a longer term defensibility? Or how, how would you consider that? So yeah, I actually really agree with Mark on this one, on the talent and culture being incredibly important in games. And I think the reason why it doesn't rise to that level of significance for the fan companies is because gaming is foundationally different from consumer internet in that gaming is this alchemy of art, design, technology, culture, and business knowledge, if you like, from free to play economy management, all the way to top funnel user acquisition management. And that requires more people to be able to share their views and discuss and feedback and find that intersection of product and insight where all of those things kind of fit, if that makes sense. Right. It's very rare to have game companies where one person makes the call and is able to say, this way of doing it will be a, it'll be an awesome game to play. It'll be technically sound. It'll be you know, um, economically uh, good from a free to play economics perspective. It'll be, uh, we can distribute it well because it'll, you know, it'll work out well. And it'll have like a really cheap tool chain or like you can author content in a, you know, a right positive way moving forward. That's kind of, it's a hard, much harder equation to, to make work in gaming than it is in consumer internet. So that's why, like from my point of view, as a, as a company builder, I become incredibly sensitive to not just the technology expertise or design expertise or, you know, or free to play economy management expertise, but how those disciplines talk to each other and how they listen to each other as a predictor of how well something goes. And even when you obviously get that perfect, it's even then you have a certain hit rate and you, you know, and can you, in my mind, the art of building game companies is almost the art of triangulation. Like you make a really good guess as to, you know, we're kind of playing this Uja game between all these different disciplines going, 
this might work from a design perspective, this might work from a distribution perspective, this might work from an economy perspective, and you sort of land on a spot. And then the question is, how quickly can you work out whether you landed at a, you know, at a success, at an almost success or a total failure, and how quickly, how well can you as a team recalibrate from there and look at, okay, this is what we can learn from this, honestly. And like Supercells is actually a good example in the sense that, you know, back when I invested and got involved, they were making a dystopian Facebook MMO, right? Something called Gunshine, which I mean, I, you know, I had no idea whether that would work. They were pretty convinced that it might because they really, they had me making cutesy mobile games for like 10 years or whatever at that point. And well, not quite 10, maybe six or seven, but they just wanted to make something like serious and real on the Facebook platform, like a real game. And they were convinced that this would work out because of they you know, done all the thinking and it didn't work out. And there, I think so much of what launched their success over the following several years was that insight that, you know what? No, we have to take business considerations more into account and play to our strengths in execution and all these other things. And they formulated a strategy and then just executed it brilliantly in terms of, you know, both in terms of the, 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 the sort of games that they chose to do and how they go into market and all of those kind of things. But much of that, I think, much of the birth of the, the, the culture and sort of that, that moment of, hey, we have to learn from our, uh, the, the first failure, I think was, was pretty important for them. So yeah, I, I would definitely elevate um, talent and manage the culture. What is the culture of managing the culture moving forward so that you don't get stuck and thinking that you're awesome because you made one good game, but rather constantly questioning yourself and figuring out how to evolve the culture. That's, that's my perspective anyway. The other, um, the other bits, I, I do agree that they are meaningful, but I would say that for gaming, the other thing to think about is that it is a very capital intensive industry these days in that things are getting more expensive to make. So having financial strength is insanely important, being able to make multiple bets, do multiple things. So the second that you have a cash cow of some form, you have a game that, that spins out cash for the company, you already set yourself up. Like that's a huge watershed in some ways um, as, a, as a, a, call it short to medium term defensibility that allows you to build long-term defensibility. Right. So it sounds like we agree in terms of organization and culture as a potential additional area of defensibility, but maybe like Christian, you mentioned Supercell and Mark, you're at Riot. I, I think like maybe one of the other aspects of defensibility that wasn't specifically called out is maybe like a subcategory under brand, which is IP. So I think in terms of brand, people think more about whether it's, you know, a, a Supercell certainly has a, has a strong brand and, you know, Tesla has a strong brand, but I, it feels like, you know, when, when I think about the League of Legends characters, for example, and the ability to take that IP, repackage it across new SKUs and things like that, how do you guys think about IP as a relevant driver, as potentially, you know, a subcategory under brand as a defensibility? I actually think it's more than a subcategory. Okay. Um, and and I, I think it actually, points to what Christian was talking about, and maybe the difference between game companies and the fan companies is that, yeah, to me, at, at our core, we're content companies. We're creating content that's consumed. Uh, and that's why some, a lot of the NFX framework, I don't think, works for us as well. Uh, so you know, when I look at the most defendable company you know, in the, what I would say, content or entertainment space, it's Disney. And that goes to culture people being able to consistently create strong content on top of each other and and then the franchises and the ip what you were talking about but i wouldn't put that as a subcategory you know again if you if 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 if, if disney is your model their their marvel ip their princesses ip their star wars ip is definitely not one of their stitches you know whereas i think the nfx framework is geared more towards digital companies that compete on technology and right. in the game space, the companies that have had the best technology or that try to compete on technology have usually failed because at the end of the day, you're creating an experience, you're creating content, and you have to continuously create content. That's why, you know, that, that one hit wonder kind of that Christian was implying, the ability to repeat it is so important. That's why you need to culture the people and to me, the, the underlying IP that you can build off of, but, and, and then the culture and people that you can still create more IP. Yeah, so I would, that's kind of how I would come sorry, I'll just add real quick. I actually really agree with that. And I think the IP, where IP tends to come from is in some ways, I think IP brand and what people associated with the thing that you make is ultimately an outside reflection of your culture. It's the outside reflection of the internal commitment of the kind of product that you're proud of and the kind of product you want to make and how you talk about it. And as a result, over, over time, people come to trust 
your value set as an organization. And obviously Disney is a, an awesome, incredible example for a very long time. But even in gaming, I think Supercell have done a very good job at their, in their corner. You know, I think um, in particular, I admire Riot a lot for having been able to strong advocacy among players that, you know, even if it maybe took a little bit, little bit of time to go from one game company to a multi-game company, even then it's very clear that the same amount of love has been put into the next product and the way that the IP universe has been built out. And I think a lot of that is not so much maybe, you know, and I, you know, obviously this is Mark to talk about this, but to me as a, as a player, a long-term player of League of Legends, to me, I always felt like I wasn't sure if this was the best, you know, you know, is this specifically artistically the best thing or have we, you know, are these voice lines the best or is this IP universe the most kind of coherent in the, in the, in the world? But it was always made with love and a lot of listening to the community and the player base. And I think that has created a certain trust in the organization um, that ultimately then makes new games that will come out, whether they are in exactly the same IP universe or not, gives them that halo of, hey, it's worth trying this because we know Riot is super serious about the culture, about the sort of the, the community and the, and the player base overall, but that really is, I suppose, Mark's story to tell. Yeah, now that's exactly right. I mean, Riot thinks of brand defensibility in two ways. One is the Riot brand, which, you know, over time, as we, as we launch multiple games, we want it to be, you know, synonymous with, with player focus and making it better to be a player. So when, when Riot releases a game in, in your favorite genre, you're super excited because you know it will be, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll solve the problems of the genre. It'll, it'll um, you know, take it to the next level and they'll support it with, with marketing and with esports and that, you know, the whole package will, uh, will be there. And so, and then on the, and then on the IP side, that's the other part of the, the brand that's important, um, especially with the League of Legends IP. You know, we, we want that to be the most loved gaming entertainment IP in the world over time. It already is in some countries in Asia, you know, it's, it's less, it's less known in the West. Um, but once, you know, if we're able to achieve that, then as we bring out new things in that IP, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's games or even other experiences, you know, it'll have a built-in audience that's excited about engaging deeper with that IP. And then that brings them back around to the, to League of Legends or the other games. And so kind of like Nintendo has done, you know, you can build an ecosystem where, where um, you know you get you get that huge advantage every time you bring out a new experience for players. But I do think right. it's important that it comes from the product that you can you know you can create the powerpoints and Excel sheets around brand and you know network effect and all these kind of things as much as you want. But it ultimately comes from is the next product great? Or are you yeah. making consistently great great product? The other thing we didn't talk about network effects, and I actually think that's one of the things that really has changed in games. I think in a big way over the past okay. five to ten years, in that as we've moved to predominantly multiplayer environments and predominantly community driven things with a lot of content consumption through you know streaming and youtube and other things it really has become like launching a new game these days is almost like thinking about launching a new nightclub in town like how do you create a place where people will want to come and hang out as an interaction space where on the one hand yeah it's fun the game is fun but on the other hand there's like a reason to be there you know and it's a it's a good way to connect and that makes the ip building side kind of interesting in that you're no longer pushing this top-down experience of this is the IP, this is the movie you're going to watch. We're going to tell you why it's great and you're going to think it's great. But it's much subtler than that. It's much more like you're building this experience that is partially shaped by you, partially shaped by the other players and somehow making people feel like they're part of it. And I think Fortnite's done such interesting things in this area over the past couple of years that it's been really fun to see how they've extended and expanded the IP kind of and what people associate with Fortnite and how that sort of what how it means so much more than a a sort of quote unquote cartoony kids game these days. I was just gonna say that you're right that at gaming companies the pressure is always on to create you know more and more compelling product, both existing franchises and new franchises. Where I think with the fan companies, you know, they could do nothing to their product for three years and it would still grow, right? That's like that's how defensible it is. Whereas at game companies, we need to keep innovating and you know raising the bar in terms of experiences and fun. I think one thing with the community is, you know, whereas it has been virtually impossible to create that defendable game company so far, just, you know, based on exper uh, the experiences, what might have changed and what might be changing, you know, as Christian said, it's changed over the last five years. Esports could totally change it also. You know, the NFL is very defendable. The NBA is very defendable. It's because, you know, it is, you know, it, 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 you don't only have the participants, you have the community, you have the gambling side of it, you have the fantasy side of it. And as esports uh, evolves that way, that, those franchises could be, 
the NFL will probably be around in 100 years, to go to your original question. You know, it's, it's hard to say what game company will. The NFL will, will almost certainly. Uh, in Europe, you know, the, 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 all, the, all the soccer leagues will be. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, that's what could be changing in the game environment now that you didn't have five years ago, that the community, it's, it's beyond community because of these sports. It's, it's just taking on a new dynamic that does make it much harder for a new entrant, but it also in, increase, increases the switching costs and it takes you off the content treadmill because you now have the users through things like fantasy and gambling and everything effectively creating their own content. Right, and maybe I think the one last category of defensibility I would probably add is just to your point earlier, Lloyd, about the specifics of our industry is that, you know, we're seeing this shift from like a unit sold business to more of a live operating model. And so maybe more of a short-term defensibility, but the fact that we are shifting to, towards this engagement monetization model and the fact that you can hold on to your customers for, in some cases, you know, like Zynga Poker or other games like that, 10 plus years or League of Legends, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you, you guys have customers for, forever but the fact that you can hold on to these customers for a much longer period of time, rather than just a, a very transactional sort of customer relationship model. But yeah, and that's where the network effects come into play, as, as Christian mentioned, right? When your friends are playing the game, you're, you're much right. more likely to start playing it. You're much less likely to stop playing it. You know, that only applies to online multiplayer team-based games, I'd say, but, um, or, you know, more so than others. But, but yeah, it's helped us evolve from like the movie franchises where, you know, they have to come up with a brand new hit movie and try to get everybody back. Uh, versus, versus just maintaining that relationship over time. Right. And so maybe kind of shifting over to how defensible are gaming companies. And so we, we kind of have this in terms of the categorizations, we've had those four broad levels of categorizations. I think we agree that there's some, uh, there, there's some defensibility around organization and culture, maybe around brand and IP. But if we look at some of the gaming companies out there today, who, who do you guys think are some of the more defensible companies and where, where's the source of their defensibility coming from, in your opinion? Yeah, I'll, I, mean, I'll I almost look at it by games, because like you said, you know, if you look at the top 10, the top 20, you know, free to play or effectively, effectively anything now, it, it, those, those are franchises. They're not going anywhere soon. You know, League of Legends, but, you know, Clash, any of those games, those are defendable. Um, the companies themselves are probably only as good as their top games right now. You know, it's, you know they're not at the point where we have, I, we don't have a Disney in the industry, I'd say. Uh, but we have some games that are going to be around at least five or 10 years. I personally don't think we have any company yet that, you know, with the possible exception of an EA or a Nintendo that has a broad enough portfolio of franchises that you can say the company is, the company is defendable, is defensible outside of its core game or core two games. I'd say the biggest exception would be Tencent who has right. such... <laughs> you know, scale and network effects in China yeah. through their ownership of QQ and WeChat and things like that, that they've created some of that broad defensibility across their network. Um, right. And, and then on their, the other parts of their business, they have, they do have network effects. They do have all those. Other, I mean, they've got every defensibility plus they own, you know, like a huge part of the entire ecosystem. So right. certainly Tencent. Uh, but in terms of like more pure play content companies, uh, I, are we, are we kind of saying that we just, aren't at that thing level of, of defensibility? I, I, is yeah, that? Actually, I would really, I guess I would really um, agree with Lloyd here. I mean, I just think that we've gone, the defensibility of game companies in the past, so go back 20 years or whatever, used to be some ability to predictably release a game every year and get it into retail stores, which is somewhat defensible. And if you can do those things and you have kind of a and in particular, if you do the same thing every year, so you can do a sequel, so you can build that brand over time, you have a locked in distribution, you have a locked in IP that you can build. It's like the EA, I suppose, like model, right? And you have locked in distribution, you can, you have this IP and you can reliably have a production process that's going to create a game that's going to have a Metacritic of like 70% or, you know, or more every year. So you don't read, you know, you don't ruin the brand. You can kind of create a bit of a cookie cutter machine almost out of that. As you not to, not to at all like, um, disrespect the amount of effort and art and hard work and you know insight that has gone into that but that created a certain level of defensibility um for a while while re retail distribution was the main distribution model but even there i guess technology moves forward all the time and like so many companies died in the console transitions at different times because they were unable to change their internal tech culture approach talent in order to deal with you know these these bigger things i think 
things are better now in the sense that yes, games live for longer. So we have longer waves, you know, to, right. to Lloyd's point, if you have a good title in the top 10 right now, chances are, if you do a semi-decent job, it's, you know, it's still meaningful for you in a couple of years time, right? Without, you know, while, you, while you're just doing a, doing a good job at it, but it's incredibly hard to say that you make one game, no matter how much you try. And maybe League of Legends is, is a really good example of a game that's been managed in, in incredibly well. Like, I mean, you know, I still tune into the LCS and I probably turned out of the game a couple of years back. And I, I can't go back in because there's too many new champions, there's too many, too many new things. But like, but I still, you know, I still tune into interesting matches and I'm still sort of in touch with that IP. So I'm interested, you know, when Valorant comes out or when Team Fight Tactics come out as a result. So like, there's a, you know, there, there's a certain very hard work gone into that defensibility. But even there, if Riot releases two, three dud games in a row, like, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know that League can like, you know, carry it alone at that moment in time. So like, to me, it is ultimately about figuring out a way for you to have the right tools between talent, culture, technology, and IP and other things, and then combine that with a financial structure that allows you to have many shots on goal. And maybe you have a one in three hit ratio, or even maybe you have to like kill internally, you know, three out of every four projects or delay them indefinitely or whatever. It's just a really painful thing. You can do it so long as you have a reliable source of cash. And I think one of the more interesting things that I've been following recently has been, say, Zynga's strategy or that of Stillfront uh, in Europe, where they've almost become these thin holding companies of multiple studios, which together where they can kind of leverage the fact that you can get relatively high multiples from public markets, from, you know, from profitable studios in different places, that way create massive financial strength that you can then use to you know, either prop up, you know, if let's say you have a studio that that, you know, happens to fail or that, you know, you need to do something new that you can weather a storm, you can weather a couple of poor releases or whatever it might be. So to some degree, I think creating that sustainable play Tika for that matter, you know, they have a very focused, you know, focused core business that, that creates a lot of financial strength for them, which they can then use to acquire companies and, or to almost indefinitely incubate new projects to try to figure out how to create that next, you know, the next cash cow for them. So it's like, I just think that we're fundamentally in the business of making art making culture, making experiences. And that never stands still. It is not a distribution business where people want boxes at home as quickly as possible from a delivery thing. Like it just isn't a platform. It is fundamentally experiences and culture always moves forward. And, you know, thank goodness we're not in the music business because there you truly have to attempt to remain relevant all the time. Um, we can at least, you know, keep our, uh, keep our titles alive for a little bit longer. But even then, I think anybody who attempts to build a game business off the back of the same kind of defensibility, like assuming that just because I own a lot of network of ads or whatever it is that I am now defensible, I think it's a dangerous idea. I think ultimately we rest on building amazing experiences that inspire, that push the industry forward where people think like, wow, I want to be part of that. That looks great. That plays great. That's an amazing thing. And I think at the end of the day, that, so you kind of can't abstract the industry away from that, in my opinion. And Lloyd and Mark, would you guys agree that it kind of sounds like what you're saying, Christian, if, if I were to try to simplify it, is that th maybe the greatest defensibility today, at least looking at the current companies, is actually deriving from more of a uh, scale defensibility in terms of having enough financial capital and then being able to diversify enough so that you're relatively safe. But uh, would, would you guys agree with that? Or in, in my, am I interpreting your yep. words correctly, Christian? I'd say that, yeah, if defensibility is a 10 point scale and, and FANG's at a 10, you know, I think the gaming industry has evolved from maybe a two back when, you know, they had to release a new boxed product every, every right. couple of years to, you know, a five or a six today with some of these sustainable franchises. Um, but, you know, it still needs to be proven that, um, you know, a game company can leverage scale and culture and, and network effects to the extent that we can create those, um, you know, to get to that, to get to that level of being, uh, you know, a hundred year, a hundred year business. Right. Because it's always going to come down to being able to create new content to satisfy your players. So all the other things help drive it. But if you can't continuously bring out that new content, then you're, you're going to fall down. I think that's what Christian was saying. Yeah, I really it's actually interesting. You mentioned Zynga and Zynga is probably the example. It's probably like, if you look at their history, there's probably like three examples with them in defensibility. I argue that if we had this conversation eight years ago, they'd probably be the company you'd have considered the most def defendable because then they had the whole 
you know, that a Facebook algorithm was working. They could, you know, release anything, copy one of Christian's games, run it through their, you know, <laughs> run it through Facebook, run it through their channels and get a hundred million, a hundred million MAU. Uh, you know, that was, yeah, and they, and they could do that without, to be blunt, any creativity, any, any of the cultural things right. that we were just talking about. Yeah. And then they got, you know, Facebook changed their algorithms and changed the policies and that, that kind of went to, that's probably the closest in my opinion that any games company has ever come to be having a defendable position. And then you, you look at you know, Zynga five years later when they had literally you know, like one and a half billion dollars in the bank and they couldn't do anything right. And so it shows that money alone and resources alone doesn't give you a defendable position. And I think now they're probably, I would put them in the conversation of companies that could be coming defendable because, you know, under Gilbo, they've been acquiring these franchises, you know, it's sort of like a mini Disney model where instead of a Marvel and, um, you know, um, Marvel and Lucas, it's been, you know, companies like Merge and Peak, but they've been able to build on these franchises. So theoretically, you know, as Christian said, you know, maybe a couple of them will falter, but then they'll grow a few of them out. And, you know, maybe that is a model. Um, but I, I think it's just interesting. It shows kind of the three spectrums and also the challenges in, in a game company trying to become defendable. Right. And Lloyd, I think you bring up a great point in terms of environmental changes, which if, if you can't adapt to certain environmental changes, maybe you really aren't that defensible. And when, we, when I think about some of the things that are happening today in terms of on the console side, shift to digital distribution, which I think is increasingly going to uh, pick up and become the dominant form of distribution on that side. When we think about what's happening on the mobile side with performance marketing and the potential to not be able to target uh, whales anymore, potentially, depending on how the whole IDFA Apple thing starts to play out. And then in terms of how, from a marketing perspective, we're at least seeing on the HD side, right? And I, I think that Riot proved this the, the best with Valorant, but like influencers and Twitch and like Twitch drops are like the new marketing on, on that side. And so when we think about some of these bigger macro trends, do we, do we think that one of the, I would say maybe one of the trends that's happening is that some of the scale advantage that we had before isn't as strong. I don't, I don't know what you guys think in terms of uh, some of these changes that are happening and what that would have as an impact to potentially like scale defensibility. Yeah, for, for what it's worth, my viewpoint is that the um, industry kind of is harder or is getting more complicated for younger companies, for less capitalized companies. It is okay. true that the scale up, but you don't need a 20 person like UA department today to do the sort of Excel sheet, you know, driven uh, campaign optimization, you know, all of that stuff is moved into a black box from, you know, for mobile gaming companies. And, and in a similar way, you may not need TV ads if you are good at building out an influencer and community driven content creation strategy. Um, that is all true. However, the underlying production value expectations from players and the degree of sophistication of the out of game experience, if you like, if you jump into, you know, whatever the gaming experience is itself, a match of League of Legends or Overwatch or, or uh, Valorant or, you know, Vainglory or Catalyst Black, that is one thing. And the, the production value expectations, they are going up all the time on every platform including mobile, or for that matter, even a match three game, if you look at how much polish goes into those games today, it's like these are not cheap things to, to create. But more importantly, all of the me mechanisms and systems outside of the match itself for social connectivity, for progression, for optimizing experiences overall, customer support, all of, I mean, all of those things are um, expensive things to get into. They take a long time to make and they take a, a, a more and more complicated variety of technologies and talent to pull together. So whereas if you started a game company 10, 15 years ago, you could get away with having a core team of say four people and start making stuff, you know? Today, yeah, you can make the core game with four people, but you are now starting to need a set of different skills and skill sets. And yeah, it's been compensated by the fact that there's more off the shelf products and a more kind of, you know, broader engines that you can pick from and, and other things. But it is just, it's a, it's a complicated place to be. So I would say that this, from a scale advantage perspective, I think it's sort of, it's almost like the, the, the curve is, if you like, um, becoming, I, I think that now the difference between having $3 billion and having a billion dollars in the bank is maybe not so big. But there's a much bigger difference between having $20 million in the bank and having $5 million in the bank than there used to be previously. Got it. 
Yeah, I'd say I, I, did, I agree to some extent, although I do say when I when I look at, you know, the competition out there as Riot moves into new genres, I mean, I think we're equally scared of, you know, three kids in their in their garage as we are Amazon and, and Google launching a game in our space, right? It's like for all the the, the advantages that that Fang has in their in their core businesses, it's not helping them in gaming whatsoever, um, you know, as, as from their recent launches yet you know, startups are still um, making big splashes with with pretty minimal budgets. And so it's uh, it's an interesting space. But yeah, I'd, I'd consider, you know, scale is, is definitely a nice to have and, and does give, you know, companies like us um, some meaningful advantages. But, you know, it also brings disadvantages of bureaucracy and size and things like that. So, um, you know, and, and 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 a watered down culture, which I think, you know, hurts places like Amazon Gaming. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's it's not a huge factor one way or the other, although, you know, on the margin it can be. So maybe that's a good segue into the next topic, which is how can game companies actually build greater long-term defensibility? And if I'm interpreting some of the things that you're talking about, Christian, it sounds like you're suggesting at least for smaller companies, they should be thinking about scale in terms of having enough capital to compete. You also talked about trying to integrate like social community aspects into game to try and build more networking defensibility. And then we've talked about organization and culture and maybe that that is something that existing game companies should be thinking more about, but would you guys agree with that? And so if you are thinking about some of the game companies out there, how can they actually build more defensibility? I don't know if this gets them to the Fang or Disney level, but yeah, you know, as Christian said, they have a lot of the game companies fail because they don't think about the things outside of just the game. So it's the live services, it's the community. Yeah, they need to be thinking about that. But I would say that same thing to an indie developer, uh, and that's where they often kind of kind of falter. I don't know if that's enough to bring them to the you know kind of Disney Amazon level of defendability. Um, there, it's you, know, you have to build that organization and, and be thinking ahead of how you're going to be creating franchises that are sustainable, and it's either through acquisition or through internal. That's you know again, if 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 the goal is to be a you know long-term defendable company, that's here, let's say ten years uh, in the game industry. I don't think you can talk a hundred years <laughs> at all. Um, but even if you're just looking ten years, you, you need those franchises. And you always have to be thinking, does it have franchise potential? Can it grow into a franchise? How do I grow it into a franchise? And then it goes into what Christian's saying. It's like, it's not just everyone's saying, but it's, it's not just about building a product. You have to do everything, not only do everything, you have to do it really, really well. Your live services have to be great. Your community management has to be great. Everything that we, we've hit on it, you, 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 we have to become, a, well, I guess, you know, an Amazon and an Apple are great companies. You have to be a great company. And to be blunt, and, and we kind of joked about it at the beginning, you know, it's like there's a lot of game companies right now that you know, maybe have a lot of the elements, but even when we were talking about culture, they're not great companies. They don't have a great culture. They're not focused on doing these things great. They're, they're focused either very short term or they're focused on, you know, putting out a lot of features or things. There's not that many game companies that are focused on being great. And you have to be, I think, if they're going to be around in 10 or 20 years. Yeah, and may maybe we could even look at specific examples. Like right now, when I talk to people in the games industry about Zynga, for example, everyone's like, yeah, Zynga is like such a fantastic, awesome company. I have more, cons I mean, and I'm a, just to be clear, I'm a fan of Zynga, but when I think about long-term defensibility and I see like the current growth and from a revenue perspective, profitabilities, you know, I mean, it's kind of up and down, but I, I don't like the fact that Zynga, for example, when we, when we talk about, for example, original IP or organizational defensibility and, you know, that basically all their growth recently has come through M&A and when that slows down, what happens, for example, I, I, I feel like, you know, that they're, they're an example where certainly like short term and for now they're great. And again, I'm a fan, but I do have concerns about defensibility for a company like Zynga. I, I think if you're going to be a great game company, you have to create great games yourself. You can't just buy them. And I think, yeah, they got the live services probably nailed. Uh, and maybe even the acquisition in the M&A side, they're getting smart at. Uh, but yeah, I have that same concern. It's like they haven't proven that they can bring out new games that are gonna that are gonna do anything. I, I guess what I would add to that though is, and I'm again like I'm 
really a game company builder more than anything else. And I think what I've come to really appreciate over time is that whenever you build a thing, like long-term sustainability comes from a series of short-term sustainabilities, if that makes sense, <laughs> in terms of the first thing you need is a team and then you need a little bit of money that's going to, in, in particular in today's world, the thing that's interesting is you used to be able to raise like a, you know, a seed round of a couple of million and put out a product and then raise more. And even sometimes like when I started, you could, you know, raise a seed round or you have three shots, you know, you allocate like half a million bucks of three to, you know, three, 400 K per product. And you try to make it like you quickly kill it if it's not working and then do the next one and kill it. If it's not working do the next one and then, you know, raise money off the back of the one that is working. Right. And um, today that's not the case. Right. I mean, you just can't do that. So what you have to do is raise enough money to be able to make a prototype. So that gives you enough, you know, so that you can somehow convince people to put in more money, i.e. to make you sustainable for the following year. You need to get a product out as soon as possible to then make you sustainable for, you know, for, for being a single game company that is profitable. Like you need to get to that point. Then you need to worry about how do I now create something that I can create multiple games off the back of with some level of reliability as to like play to my strength so that somehow, whether it's the community or the IP or the technology or the specific angle or the specific platform or specific distribution model, like really focus on like, you know, getting your claws into some, some part of the industry to create that short-term sustainability. And it always, unfortunately, in the short term, for the longest time, it will come down to financial stability. And can you, do you have enough that you can go and invest deeply into the things that you want to invest in, knowing that it's okay to fail because gaming is risky in general. And so the thing that I admire about Zynga strategy is not so much, is this the way to create the 100-year game company? It is more compared to where they started. Oh, well, didn't, well, let's say like that point five, six years ago, uh, somebody mentioned earlier with like, hey, you have 1.5 billion in the bank when say Frank Gibault joined, for example. The thing I admire is identifying the situation as, hey, maybe our internal studio isn't set up correctly. Let's figure out what, is the, what does this company need to look like in five years time? Well, we need to have several top 10 titles in different categories and different genres one way or the other, right? Because that way we are going to create financial strength for ourselves to figure this out. And so then going ahead and acquiring as aggressively and successfully as they have done in those spaces, is that the recipe for the very long term? Probably not, but it does buy them the next five years in order to figure out, you know, figure out the rest. Yeah. I, to, like, to your point, Christian, to have long-term sustainability, you need to be around next year. <laughs> and in yeah, the exactly. So like, I think that the, the art is like, and ultimately even this is what I find so interesting and why I find running game companies so fun is that it's always there's such a trade-off between trying to figure out how do we do something really awesome today and how do we do it in a way that we can also do awesome things tomorrow and we can be more sustainable, whether that's everything from how to manage like, you know, people's working hours and like, like how much effort is being put in all the way to how much of the tech that you're building should be kind of platformized so that you can then make it easier to do the next thing versus how much it's just we do what it takes in order to get the product out, if that makes sense. And all of those are super nuanced decisions. And back to the talent point, you need to have a team that can like truly trust each other's viewpoints and calls in some of these areas of like, I always want a product out as soon as possible, but I need to have a, you know, I need to have a CTO that can tell me that you can probably get it out in that time, but you're going to be in real trouble in six months time because we wouldn't have done the things that you would, you're going to be screaming at me for why our live ops are is so slow. So like figuring out that balance of sustainability, like on the one hand, short-term velocity, and on the other hand, building for sustainability, um, on the other hand, and it's, they are really, really interesting nuanced calls that you need a great, great team and a great culture and lots of individual talent and talent density and lots of listening inside of the team to, again, make your best guess, but they're always guesses, right? You may get them wrong. Right. Maybe as in another example, EA and Nintendo, certainly well capitalized, but I think what we're seeing from a defensibility perspective with those two companies is their inability to make the platform transition to Lloyd's earlier point in terms of like, capitalizing well enough on mobile. And in fact, you know, Nintendo's kind of retreating from, from mobile to some degree. Uh, EA has been kind of struggling with mobile as well. So I'm, I'm wondering from a defensibility perspective, when we look at some of those companies, how would you think about improving defensibility for those companies? Yeah, I mean, Nintendo has the IPs, which give them some degree of defensibility over time. Um, but yeah, they, they need to survive platform transitions. Um, I mean, I think if I were, you know, not that I'm in a position to give them advice, but I think when they do build these teams, uh, you know, that Christian was talking about a, a key 
a key, you know, you need to have several members of that team that are just passionate about the, the genre, the space, the games they're trying to build, right? Like, um, you know, at least in our experience at Riot, if we're going to build a tax shooter, you know, a meaningful portion of that team is going to be people that have thousands of hours in tax shooters. And if we're going to build a collectible card game, it's the same. And so, um, you know, I would think for, for Zanga in almost any category, you have passionate players of that. And of course you need the other, it can't, you can't just be a passionate player. You have to have the talent, you have to have the, the business sense. You need to surround them with, with people that they work well together with. But um, sometimes that seems to be lacking when some of these companies are building games in, in different genres. You know, they, they see that it looks good on a spreadsheet and they build it with, with that in mind, but not with the, the passion that, that ends up making all those micro decisions more effective and, uh, and, and you know, creates an overall vision for the game. Great. And maybe as a last example, my favorite mobile company, uh, and I'm sure a company close uh, to your heart, Christian, Supercell. How do, how do you guys think about Supercell's defensibility? Certainly, I think that you know, they've done amazing. But if you were to think strategically about how Supercell should increase their defensibility, how, how would you guys be thinking about it? I'm in no position to offer Supercell any advice. I remember <laughs> the last like major, you know, back when I was on the, on the board, they had, uh, it's kind of like my, literally my career is filled with these, these types of stories that always keep me, keep me incredibly grounded on the, uh, they were about, they were, had been working on Boom Beach for a long time and their product lead. You're right. They are really independent. Oh, they were certainly back then. I haven't, you know, I'm not super close to them at the moment, but they are very, very independent cells. The idea, hey, let's just get the best talent in the room. They'll make the game. They will decide when they launch it and when they kill it and all sorts of things. Like just a really, really good culture for that moment in gaming because you could make games with like a 10 person team. And if you get the best people, they will make the best games. And that's like being the Supercell motto from the start. Anyway, they were making Boom Beach. They had, um, they were, uh, I was part of the internal, internal test flight for a while. And I wrote this like at one point in time, I wrote this really long essay to the, to the dude driving it going like, hey, listen, I, I'm like, I'm now 20 hours into this thing. And I, you know, you make the call, like, obviously, I'm, you know, this is just one player's opinion. But like, to me, this like, this lacks social elements. To me, it's like, it feels incredibly on rails. It feels incredibly predictable. It feels like a poor, like the poor step cousin of Clash of Clans with zero social systems of any kind. It's so, like, I, I don't, you know, in, in my mind, as a player, I would look at this for like, a couple of hours because it's supercell i would try it for a little while but i can't you know for the life of me i can't understand why i would either stick around or you know pay money in this game so like obviously it's totally your call but i would think about maybe like have you thought about just literally going back to the drawing board on this particular product uh, and like this long thing like you know basically advocating that they should probably not like i mean you know put it maybe in beta somewhere but like they should really think about killing it and uh, the guys say hey, thank you so much for the thoughtful feedback Full stop. We're, gonna, we're, we're launching it. <laughs> and I said, I forwarded when it broke a billion dollars in, you know, cumulative revenue, I forwarded him that email going, I'm glad that you're shot calling this and not me, if that makes sense. So like, I do think that it's, it's, it is enormously difficult, like game making to everybody's point is like, a, it's a subtle art and needs to be driven by inspiration and by folks who are really, really deeply into that product and deeply into that genre and have a really superior understanding of what players are after like on a really subtle level not just on a superficial powerpoint level right. and um and as a result i think the um like folks like supercell they have had a for a long time a really really good way of doing this now you could argue that gaming has moved on you know maybe the type of games and how we make games uh and will make games over the next five to ten years might be a little bit different so the question to me is like that they, they have an amazing culture or is that paired up with the kind of tools tool chains kind of that are conducive to larger projects because you will need to put more people on this and it's ultimately what killed a bunch of companies between let's say playstation one playstation two transition playstation two to playstation three transition in terms of production values it's just that how you like how technical art works for 2d 2.5d type games versus how it works for say you know some of the things that riot's working on right now it's just it's a really different way of making games and you can maybe no longer lock 10 people in a room and create a competitive product if you're interested in those broader categories and that way of making product. So to me, it would be like some of those, like it may be not so much talent or culture or certainly not financial strength, but maybe maybe looking at what kind of like, what is the 10 year horizon of the style of games they want to make? And are they set up correctly from a, and have they built and dedicated enough time to say, 
tool chains because they didn't used to at least have a centralized team to do any kind of central tech because they were so believing in these distributed teams, which may continue to be the right thing. Although a lot of people today would say you probably should at least think about a technology strategy that is a, you know, has yeah. some centralized components. But anyway, I mean, that's, you know, I, I'm in no position to offer any advice. They've done incredibly well, you know, throughout. So it's very, you know, it feels Yeah, I'm, I'm probably even less qualified to provide advice to Supercell. But if just kind of thinking strategically, I, I do feel like some things that they could think about would be, one, if we agree that IP is a critical defensibility for gaming companies that that I actually believe that they have incredible IP in terms of the Clash IP, but then to broaden that beyond the mobile audience, whether it's taking across different platforms, console, et cetera, I, I, I think that would help increase their defensibility. I also think that from an organizational perspective, it does seem that you know Supercell uh, has, I would say maybe if Supercell could think about organizational scale, right? And so like in terms of scaling their company outside of Helsinki and being more of a global organization rather than a, a more of a Finnish focused company. And then probably the last point is, is you mentioned in terms of like decentralization has worked really well for them. But if, if you are to, if you do believe that you can get some advantage through scale in terms of investing in a centralized infrastructure, tech, technological infrastructure, to your point, Christian, and then maybe the, like the last point I would make is that, that the organizational structure of Supercell in terms of small teams around games that don't have a big content treadmill would limit the kind of games that you can make to, you know, kind of smaller PVP multiplayer types of games, but then to then try and think about how you would support other kinds of teams for other types of games would be, again, my very unqualified advice to, to Supercell. So, I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts as well. I mean, I think you hit on one that really resonates with me. It's like, I'm not going to give advice to Supercell. I feel uh, it, you know, hypocritical doing that, but I, I, I like the idea where you said, like getting beyond that Finnish focus in terms of, you know, if they, if they are going to stick with the decentralized, so maybe the two work against each other, why not have teams in different geos and really places where there's a lot of cognitive diversity? So, you know, if Finland's a relatively homogenous place, uh, because it also goes to having this stream of games and having, you know, it, it, it does come down to, even for the best companies, to shots on goals, even the Disney's in movies, some of the movies are going to fail. So if they're really good at the decentralized small teams thing, you know, maybe you know, put some teams in Eastern Europe and Eastern United States and East Asia or whatever, uh, you know, and, 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 and just you know, get some new ideas and you know, get them working together. That, that would probably be, you know, I think they probably already have probably the best chance of having, or one of the best chances of becoming one of the defendable game companies. Uh, but getting more shots on goals and different shots on goals with it, you know, bringing in a different mindset um, might be something that would be worth trying. Yeah, when we were working on Team Fight Tactics, um, you know, after the the launch of Dota Auto Chess, which we were all playing a lot of, it was it was so much fun. And uh, the biggest fear I think that I had was that was that Supercell, um, you know, would put together a 15-person team and come out with a mobile auto battler using their IP that and with their with their um, you know development capabilities and talent, they could have created an incredible auto battler on mo on mobile probably um, more efficiently than anyone. And I was actually surprised that. And, and you know we heard they were about to launch a game, and I thought, oh, here it comes. And then it was it was Rush Wars, and um, and I was kind of surprised that they didn't you know that they didn't attack that space, which you know is probably going to be a billion dollar game over time. Um, and so so yeah, I, I, if I were them, I would probably think back to why you know where what has happened with innovation. Uh, they've they've had such incredible success, such an impressive company with with several uh, billion dollar games, but you know. I don't know how long it's been since the last release that, that was on that that path. It's been a little while now. So, you know, they, maybe it's maybe it's the you know they've gotten too big for their tech or their capabilities or they're they're too insular to to where they're located, as you both mentioned. But um, but yeah, I think they're you know they certainly have the potential to be one of the defensible companies if they can keep the innovation train going. Yeah, yeah. actually, I have a I have a controversial point to make it that. Okay. I actually think that for sustainability, you have to have meaningful failures reasonably frequently because I do think that part of the issues with like, why do you become slow? You know, pretty much whatever your size might be is that if you have something good going for you, something that has worked, something that's proven, 
like either explicitly or just implicitly, just subconsciously, it's proven that, hey, this my way of doing this thing is working. At that moment in time, you stop questioning yourself. You stop having the kind of paranoid, you know, nightmares about all the ways in which you're going to fail. And you stop kind of having the kind of aggressive hunger that you always have to have both, I mean, in general as an entrepreneur, but especially in the game industry where like the status quo never stands still. So it constantly keeps moving. And like, in, it's interesting, even I, you know, I do a, a fair bit of um, CD investing and work I just because I enjoy working with uh, entrepreneurs in gaming. And it is incredible how often great outcomes and great teams get built out of a recent failure and the, the sort of the, the rage and the correction, like the, that sense of, I know exactly what went wrong here. I need, I'm, I'm going to fi- figure it out. I'm going to fix it. Um, and, you know, to some degree, even that's part of the Supercell origin story, I suppose. But, but there are many, many other examples. And I think part of the kind of to create real long-term sustainability, you need to figure out how to sustain that fire. And maybe sometimes you just need to arrange a strategic punch in the face for the whole organization to kind of shake it. Because culture is a great form of defensibility, but it can actually almost become your enemy over time, if you have a culture that understands and believes that this is the way to do things, we have a good thing going, we are, things are going well, then why question anything in some ways you kind of, I guess the human mind wants to feel safe. And at that moment in time, you know, if you have no reason to not feel safe, you end up feeling safe. And whatever is going on kind of um, culturally, ultimately ends up reinforcing that state as opposed to questioning that state. So, and again, I don't know that there's much advice in there, but I do think that a reasonably high profile failure every now and then is pretty important to keep you on your toes and remind you, whether it's as an individual or as an organization, that you know you, this move, industry moves on all the time, no matter how great you were yesterday, you need to make an amazing product tomorrow in order to remain relevant. And maybe as a last example, Mark, since you're here, uh, in terms of Riot, how are you guys thinking in terms of long-term defensibility? Are you, uh, you know, not, not that we are asking you to release the secret playbook, but just in terms of like how you're thinking about it strategically, it'd be great to understand how you Feel guys- Feel free to release it. the secret playbook also. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, t- I've touched on it a little bit. I think, um, you know, when we look at the, the, the levers of defensibility that we've talked about, I think the, the network's effects and the scale are ones that, you know, Riot is benefiting from now, but can only take you so far. I think the, the brand is really where, you know, we're leveraging our future, you know, both as, a, as I mentioned, what, what the Riot brand stands for and, and how much of a built-in audience we'll have every time we bring in a new experience because of the, the trust and the excitement that people have for the Riot brand. And then also the IPs, um, we just think there's so much potential to, you know, as Nintendo has done with some of their IPs, um, you know, we think that that's what we're striving to do with, with the League of Legends IP, which is why we've invested so much into, you know, every aspect of it, not just like the esports side of things, but the, the music, the videos, the, the um, you know, all the different CGI, that, that everything that, that goes into developing those characters, um, comic books, you know, it's, and so the backstories are being built out, the universe is getting more interesting and, and more complex over time. And so once you have that foundation, there's so much you can do on the back of that. And, and it was actually a tough call with Valorant. Do we put that in the league IP or not? And um, it could have gone either way, but, you know, eventually decided that um, for that game and for that genre, it, it needed its own IP, which is, which is quite different from the league IP. Um, and so, you know, it remains to be seen if we will equally invest in that over time um, or if that is more of just a one-off, it's its own little world. But, um, but yeah, I think brand is, is where we think the defensibility will come from um, in the video game space. And so, so that's probably the primary focus. Right. And then just moving to the next section, uh, what kind of management team do you guys think is required to help game companies build this longer term defensibility now? You know, when we think about a company like Amazon and think about where they would be without Jeff Bezos or Facebook, without Mark Zuckerberg, maybe the more general question is what should management teams be thinking about to help increase uh, defensibility? How should they support long-term defensibility in their companies? I mean, I think one of the things is, as Christian said, there's a lot of elements to it. So there isn't, it, it's, it's pro- in the game industry, it's probably going to be less dependent on one person and you do need that robust management team that can support design, that can support your live services, that can support your UA with, you know, great people in each. You know, I do think you need kind of that design visionary, you know, and I don't even know if they exist yet in the game industry, but you need kind of the Johnny Ive, 
workforce if you're going to be a long-term defendable content company uh, or some someone close because uh, as I said I don't even know if they exist in our industry yet uh, so you do need a, someone who has great product vision and can connect with consumers and you know really drives that but you also need the people who are going to and the technology infrastructure you know the conversation we just had about supercell and you know the potential weaknesses there uh, I, th I think the, the important thing is having that robust management team because it doesn't come down to one rock star it, games are a really complex business they're probably I, I wouldn't say they're more complex than Amazon but they're more complex than you know they're more complex than a movie uh, and I think having a team that can support that is really the critical element now I was gonna say I actually think I would say that there's like four of four most critical components in my opinion like if you have to like try to narrow it down to the, the the least amount of people i do think that you need first and foremost somebody who very strongly uh, empathizes with creative leadership and passion and the player of understanding like at the at the very foundational level like games is entertainment and games is this you know alchemy of culture and art and all of these things which and can go out and recruit great creatives can go out and recruit build great teams and figure out how to kind of do the 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 sort of the very basic trying to inspire talent to join your thing because that supercell motto of the best people make the best games <laughs> as simplistic as it sounds it's true like it's a this is an industry that is insanely talent density really you know focused so being able to recruit really great gaming industry talent is and keep them over time is probably the single most important thing i would say as i've said th throughout i guess that i feel like the most underappreciated talent but which is insanely important in gaming is figuring out the financial side of it like whether it's what zynga did in terms of going okay we may not have all the talent we want at the moment but hey let's figure out our you know financial sustainability let's go acquire let's go do whatever it takes to create that medium term sustainability to give your own creatives to give that other guy who's going to figure out how to build the ip and do all the other stuff you know give that person the, the space i do think that the third person you're going to need is somebody who has a pretty deep and humble understanding of the technology bits in games because we're seeing such convergence right now between the methodologies the tech stacks the ways in which like you have like this explosion almost cambrian explosion of types of games gaming devices that can play games and there's a lot of individual bits of knowledge that go from making triple a games to console all the way to making the hyper casual you know hyper casual experiences on mobile which are all relevant to how to make great games over the next five to ten years and having somebody who's intensely curious about the tech landscape and making really good tech choices to build some kind of sustainable technology advantage or approach advantage at least over the medium to long term i think is is, is really important and then finally i think you need somebody who is deeply and equally intensely humbly curious about all things to do with data behavioral psychology and um sort of modeling in the most broad sense of how to instrument everything how to how to interpret what's going on and how, again obviously you can build teams in these areas but like who's who kind of is very very driven by hey what can we observe observe versus the sort of the, the yang to the yin of that first guy who's going to be building creatively awesome inspirational product and if you can get those four people to understand each other and to find that sort of venn diagram you know center of things which will work for all of them i think you're off to a good start yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and i think um getting back to the question i think the founders you know of facebook and amazon were, were so critical during the early years and and you know the important lessons over time but only because they they bring in those teams um that that have all those key capabilities and they establish the the culture um you know the mission the values and like uh, you know, I don't think the words on the paper are too important when companies write down mission statements, but to the extent that it's something they live every day and drive every day, like it actually, um, you know, it can be, it can be um, pretty impactful. And I think if you look at like the, the stated mission statements of, of the FANG companies, you can actually see the defensibility that they're going for, like coming through in those statements, right? Like it's, it's Facebook's mission to build community and bring the world closer together. That's, you know, all about the network effects. And, 
and Google's organizing the world's information, you know, building something unassailable. Amazon is, you know, Earth's most customer-centric capability where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. And again, they've created massive defensibility through that. Whereas if you look at gaming companies, you know, a lot of the mission statements either talk about the kind of talent they want to hire, which is important, or they talk about, you know, creating blockbuster franchises and commercial success, which again is important, but that's not necessarily the, the inspirational, um, you know, goal that's going to create something defensible over the long term. So I think that might be a good place to start, you know, for, for startups or companies that are, that are looking to create something defensible is, is figure out what it is they're trying to, you know, create for the, for the gaming world. Um, that hasn't been done before that's better than than anyone's doing it and uh, and you know b build off of that Okay, great. Maybe we could end with one final question and so I'll so if you guys could just talk about what who which game company do you believe has the best chance like besides Tencent of being around a hundred years from now and if you have a final message for our audience, maybe we can end on that note uh, maybe starting with you Christian uh, I think my connection is failing again. It must be. I'm pretty sure somebody else wants to start this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. I actually, so right now, I guess if I had to pick out two companies actually uh, that I admire at this moment in time in terms of their, uh, and not so much their current position, although it's strong, but rather their ability to kind of maneuver, if you like, and reinvent themselves. Because I do think that that reinvention, almost like the second derivative of change, like is really important because you do need to reinvent yourself with, you know, re reasonable frequency. And so I would actually pick Epic and I would pick Riot for the reasons of like from, from Epic, obviously going, having an engine company that also deeply, deeply cares about games led by a guy who deeply cares about games um, that has successfully, not just because they made Fortnite, but rather because on the one hand, yes, they made Fortnite, they used that to really push into mobile in a big way and really begin to fundamentally rethink their tech and approach in such a way that, you know what, that their engine is meaningful to the mobile gaming crowd. But at the same time, really innovating in areas around live ops and the whole media blend or whatever you want to call it, of bringing in rock concerts and whatnot into Fortnite, which is just to me shows like willingness to take risk, despite the fact that they're hugely successful already, pushing it and kind of taking risk in different areas in different ways to me has been like, and compared to the company they were like five years ago and then opening up a store, taking on Android, you know, all of those things to me just shows like a company that's, that's not satisfied with the status quo. I'm sure Fortnite will, you know, ultimately come down. And although I think it's enormously resilient, I have my family squad, we play every day. Right. So like, I feel like it's resilient for lots of different reasons, but I just feel like they've, they've done such good, work in so many good directions that I would, I think they have a good chance of being, being around for a very long time. Like again, hundred years, I think is a ridiculous standard to hold, but like, I do think that they've navigated many, many bits of change in the industry and, and they've led many of those changes in ways which suggest that their culture and their setup and their mindset is one that is likely to survive many changes to the industry. And Riot from the perspective of, again, going from one game company it's a really hard thing I think to do. And obviously Mark might know this, obviously might just might know the story a little bit better than I do. But going from a, a single game company with, with, a, with very, 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 very humble roots in lots of different ways to ultimately be able to, in the course of a relatively short time, not just launch good new games, but launch them on different platforms in different ways with quite innovative go-to-market methods. Uh, and I'm sure like lots of pain and lots of failures also going through some cultural like, you know, changes, I suppose, in a big way, management changes, but also going through some crises and other things and emerge at the other end at, you know, with the strength they have right now, I think I just admire that a lot. And I think that gives a, that can, you know, that sort of, again, the ability to do new things on new platforms in new ways and, and be resilient through crisis, I think is a good sign for the future. Again, like no pressure mark, but like, I'm going to look for you in the, whatever it's hundred years, you see, see where you're at. Well, coming from you, appreciate that very much. And yeah, um, I, yeah, actually, I thought your answer made a lot of sense. I'm curious to hear what Lloyd, what Lloyd has to say, but um, yeah, in addition to trying to drive that outcome for Riot, which I think that is, you know, that is the goal. Um, yeah, e Epic has done so many impressive things and, and is really, you know, trying to build out that full ecosystem where, you know, they become the first place that gamers go, um, you know, to either hang out with their friends or to access other ga non-Epic games or to, you know, uh, to build games using their, their impressive engine. And so, um, so yeah, they would probably be top of my list too. Maybe maybe next to Nintendo, just because of the uh, the IP. Although they need to uh, 
you know, they, they need to leverage it on, on mobile to make that, to make that a reality. Um, but yeah, I, I, every I time you think that you can count Nintendo out, every time you think, Hey, yeah, you know, I'm no longer worried about Nintendo. They always right. strike back in some new, you know, unforeseen way. So yeah, Nintendo, they may well, they may well be there. Too. And that's both Epic and Nintendo are so innovative, right? They, they just, they do things that nobody else would try and they pull it off more often than not. And so, yeah, I would agree. So I'm happy that I'm going last because I'm going to cheat and copy uh, what I've just heard largely. And I, I don't even feel comfortable, you know, pr predicting five years from now because of the game industry. Uh, but, you know, the two companies I go with are Epic and Nintendo. So Epic, because they've had repeated successes in different areas. So if you look at like a superstar investor or great game company, they're the furthest from a one hit wonder, you know, starting you know, going from Unreal to becoming an engine company, well, actually from being an engine company to going to Unreal to Fortnite, you know, and, and huge, tremendous successes in, in, in relatively different areas. Uh, that gives me confidence that at a minimum they're resilient and they might not be the number one game company in 10 or 20 years, but they're going to be around because they don't need, you know, they, they've shown that they can create successes multiple times in a changing environment. So, um, and I, I probably wouldn't have thought of it if Christian and Mark didn't talk about it first. So I, I won't uh, say it. And the other one that I, I would have probably brought up instead first is Nintendo, even though they have struggled with free to play, even though they've struggled on mobile, you know, to me, this industry is still about creating great content and that content translating into franchises, which is sustainable. And, you know, again, they've been able to repeat creating great content now for, you know, tens of years, uh, which you don't see very often. And it's not in different content and different, different genres. Um, and I'll bet on content all the time. Uh, so those are the two I probably go with, but my guess is it's probably someone we haven't even talked about today. Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, I would actually cheat a little bit and just and pick Roblox, you know, as a, not a pure content company, but because they own a platform, they have network effects, they have brand effects, they, they've got all sorts of defensibilities, and they have the potential to actually expand out to other markets and things like that. But um, anyway, I definitely want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, we, we did run long just because I was so interested in hearing all of your responses to things. <laughs> and I don't have that many opportunities to speak to guys of your caliber. So definitely appreciate it. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. But that, that'll do it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.